Welcome to Yomrak Life for Wednesday, June 28th, show number 1140. I am your host, Sean King. Thank you guys very much for joining me here live on the show or via the archive, however you so choose. You can always join us in the IRC chat room. I mentioned this because we see, I see we've got a new uh, viewer in our Google Hangouts, uh, Bobby. Hey, Bobby. Bobby McGee. I don't know. Bobby, uh, if you want to, you can join us in the IRC chat room right there on the front page of the YourMacLifeShow.com website below the video. Our good friend Monty has set up an IRC chat room link. All you do is put in your name and it drops you into the IRC I, yeah, drops you into the IRC chat room. Really easy to do. Um, folks in IRC, there's Bobby. Bobby joined in the IRC chat room. I love when people take my commands and orders as gospel. Uh, on tonight's show, we're going to talk to, uh, sorry, for, so for everyone else who's, who's listening, uh, IRC chat room is really easy to get into. Front page, yourmaclifeshow.com. There underneath the video is an easy way to jump in. You don't even have to know anything about IRC. Just that's where I always say half the fun of the show comes from is being in the chat rooms. Uh, IRC, or if you're a Slack user, yourmaclife.slack.com. You can also join us in the Slack room for the IRC um, for, sorry, for the text chatting there, Slack is a little more full-featured than the uh, IRC channel. For example, uh, MacMan just posted a link to a black-and-white photo. If he had done that in the Slack room, the photo would show up in the Slack room. We wouldn't have to go to another browser to see the picture he posted. So that's one of the reasons why I like Slack more than IRC. And Slack is open all the time. I've got Slack open on my desktop anytime. So anytime you guys want to chat or I want to chat, I do it in Slack. Uh, also, email. Send us emails to onair at yourmaclifeshow.com. In particular, tell me your iPhone story, your original iPhone story. Tomorrow at 6 p.m. Eastern time is the official launch of the iPhone 10 years ago. And as I've been thinking about it over the last week or so, I don't think we're ever going to see a product launch like that from 10 years ago. I don't think we're ever going to see any product released or announced that has that effect in the moment that the iPhone did. It certainly helped that Apple had built up excitement for those folks who remember Apple had had announced the iPhone the previous January at Macworld Expo. And then they um, said they were going to sell it in six months' time. So there was an opportunity for all this excitement to build. It was interesting to um, see <laughs> funny little story about the – there's been several stories in the last uh, se seven days about the original four – Reviewers: David Pogue, Ed Bag, David Pogue in the New York Times, Ed Bag of USA Today, uh, Steve Levy of Wired, and Walt Mossberg of the Wall Street Journal. The the those four guys were the four reviewers chosen by Apple. The only four reviewers who got the iPhone early to review it. Well, the funny story is that I uh, was working for Pogue at the time. And one of the things I was doing for him was driving him to the airport because he was a cheap son of a bitch and didn't want to pay the 225 bucks for the car service to go back and forth from Connecticut to the New York City airport. So he hired me at 75 bucks, again, cheap son of a bitch, uh, to drive his car to the airport and then back home to Connecticut. Well, on one of these trips, my wife, ex-wife Lisa, uh, came with us. And Pogue said, I got something to show you guys. And he pulls out the original iPhone. And so we were the some of the first non-reviewers. I don't know about Bag or Mossberg or Levy, whether they showed other people, but Pogue did. He showed us the iPhone. We're playing, he's driving, and we're so we're playing, Lisa and I are playing with the iPhone talking about it. And I took some pictures of Lisa with the iPhone. And Pogue said, Don't post those. Don't post those until the embargo's up at 6 p.m. on July 29th. Because that's when his review would go. I said, no, no, no problem. So I set up a website so that at 6.01 p.m. it would go live with the pictures that I had taken of Lisa with the iPhone. So next day we go and we're in line. We'll talk more about that a little bit later on. Lisa gets a phone call on 
the day after, so J- June 30th, and she is almost in tears on the phone. I'm like, what's wrong? She's like, eh, okay, okay, okay. That's all she's saying. She's off, she gets off the phone. She's very, very upset. I said, what's wrong? That was someone at Apple. They, they, were, they were demanding I take down the photos of me with the iPhone. I was like, wait, someone at Apple? What do you mean someone at Apple? This person, Apple PR, was was mad at me about the photos. And I said, well, first of all, the, the embargo's up. Secondly, you're in the photos. You didn't take the photos. Thirdly, the photos are on my website. It's your Mac life with Sean King. So they should be contacting me. Apple PR had my phone number. They should also have been smart enough to figure out which of their reviewers had allowed these photos to be taken and gotten on his ass about this. But no, they went after the girl. You cowards. You weasels. I never did get an an email or a phone call or anything from Apple PR. And no, I didn't take the goddamn photos down. Screw you guys. But she was worried that Apple would put us on a list and not allow us to buy, not allow us to buy anything anymore. <laughs> I wouldn't have gone to the original iPhone launch if, unless Macworld Magazine was, wasn't was paying me. I'm sorry, Macworld Magazine hired me to go down and shoot video. I think I've got the, the video here. I don't know if you guys should, let me know if you guys in the chat rooms should still be able to hear me, I think, I hope. Can you guys in, in in the chat room still? I don't know if this is working. Yes. Nope. You can't hear me. Sorry. Could you guys hear me while I was talking over that? Okay. So yeah. Don't hear the no no yeah you you Monty you want to hear me not the audio from the the uh, the the video. So you guys can hear me. That's good. That's that, that's what I wanted. Um, so we went down there. Um, at five, we were there at five p.m. today, ten years ago, and we were number sixty-five and sixty-six in line, and we were there all night long, all through all through the evening, um, around midnight. Um, every couple hours, I think Apple would would allow us to go to the bathroom. They come down the line and let people go in groups. Um, in the morning, they brought us coffee. At noon on the 29th, they brought us water and stuff, which was very, very, you know, very nice of them. Um, yeah, young Sean, yeah, 10 years ago, I didn't have any hair, I'm like a newborn baby for crying out loud. Um, so Macworld paid us or paid me, and they paid me enough that it paid for the trip and the iPhone. I actually parked my motorcycle across the street from where we're standing right there and got a ticket and didn't care because the ticket price was covered by, by Macworld. It was, yeah, that was Gene Munster, Dave D. It was an amazing scene as we got closer to it. When it first started off as just being, you know, the nerds hanging out. Um, it wasn't until the next morning that the uh, moment started to catch up to us because at about four or five o'clock in the morning, the media truck started t- to show up and there were hundreds of media people there, hundreds of them. There was every single major network had a truck there. Um, you saw some fairly well-known media personalities, uh, walking around looking kind of befuddled. Like, why are you all so excited about this? And as the line grew, as the excitement grew, um, you got caught up in all this stuff, and it was really kind of interesting. Uh, I, like I said, I don't think we're ever going to see an event like this ever again, where people from all walks of life would be willing to wait upwards of 48 hours, if not longer, for this device. It was really, really interesting to me. The The... I guess the lack of a better term, the, the sociological aspect of it, the fact that um, these folks are uh, were willing to wait for very, very long periods of time. To There's Lauren Finkelstein uh, helping me uh, do, do video. Um, there's our motorcycle. That's where we were sitting. That's our motorcycle gear. 
right there. Uh, that's Lisa's red helmet. And we just in, I just interviewed people in line. It was it was kind of fun, you know, just walking up and down the line, uh, interviewing random strangers about why they were there. Um, the idea that we would do that at that time was a lot of fun. We're not going to do it anymore. We we don't. This would be a few people standing in line for the iPhone eight or nine or ten or twelve and going to the future, but there will not be. I don't believe anyway, the incredible interest from so many people, both nerds, average people, uh, the media, not just tech media, but just the general media. Uh, if you watch that video, it's up on the YouTube. It's also linked on, on Loop Insight site, Loop Insight site. Um, Lisa got interviewed on Good Morning America for crying out loud. She did her own personal unveiling of her iPhone uh, right there live on Good Morning America, which is just sort of mind-boggling. Um, I got asked to do interviews. I was like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm part of the media. I'm not going to be interviewed by the media. No, I'm, I'm not that, that, that guy. Uh, and then we all went off to, Lauren will correct me if I'm wrong, I think we went to a coffee shop or his house. I can't remember which. A bunch of us to uh, just play with our, our new iPhones. And I don't think anybody realistically saw the future of the iPhone. I don't think anyone really saw that how this thing was going to change everything. Um, Monty says it was definitely a lifetime event the day that Nokia and BlackBerry both asked, what the hell just happened? I don't think so. I don't think Nokia and BlackBerry in the moment thought that. I think it took them a while to realize. One of the things that I'd be interested to know from folks at Apple is did you think or did you realize that you were creating not a phone but a very small personal computer? Because I think that's what BlackBerry, Nokia, Microsoft, everybody missed. Not that Apple was creating a phone. And I think that's why Nokia and those guys said, well, you know, Apple is not a phone manufacturer. They don't know anything about phones. They can't come in here and take over the phone market. And they're right, but Apple didn't. Apple invented a handheld personal computer that just happened to make phone calls. That, to me, is and was the key of the iPhone. It's not a phone. It's a computer that makes phone calls. Dave D says, I saw that right away when Steve Jobs announced it. Wasn't it obvious? No, I don't think it was obvious. I think a lot of people, because we, we tend to look to what we know. We know phones. We know smartphones. We knew what they were before the iPhone. We knew what they were after the iPhone. And we kept thinking of it as a phone. Whereas I think uh, we, uh, those other companies, and a lot of us, missed that it wasn't a phone. Actually, the phone features of it were awful. Uh, it was on a slow network. Um, it was awful for a long time while AT&T's network tried to catch up. Your calls dropped all the time. Apple used to have a thing on the phone where when your call dropped, you could report to Apple that your call dropped. That's how often they dropped calls. Scott Thrift says, the biggest real change was the App Store. And like every other phone, you could now add features to your phone. That was what came on afterwards, like, a, what, a year later. Um, to me, the biggest thing of the iPhone at that moment was the browser. Because previous phones, uh, the whole internet, sorry, the whole mobile internet was uh, WAP-based, W-A-P, which I believe for wireless accessible pages or something along those lines. It was basically you had to redo your website to be seen on a smartphone. But the Safari browser didn't require that. It would, it would automatically switch the, your website to be viewable on uh, the screen of the iPhone. And that was incredible. Utterly, utterly incredible. Wireless, acts, wireless accessibility protocol, WAP. And it, the WAP made phones look, made websites look awful. You didn't do any web browsing on the WAP protocol because it was just it was torturous. But Safari 
on the original iPhone made browsing the web possible. It didn't always work. It didn't always look good. The fact that Flash wasn't available turned out to be a blessing. We a lot of us, a lot of people didn't think it was. I did because I hated Flash. Everyone hates Flash, but it changed the way we browsed the internet, the way we accessed the internet. Um, and I think that was a bigger deal than almost anything else. Later on in the show, we're going to talk about uh, a gentleman named. Uh, let me get his name right, Ralph Barone. Ralph uh, wants to move up to a real camera, and he asked me a bunch of questions on Facebook. They're great questions. Thanks, Ralph. Uh, We're going to talk to Ralph about his questions a little later on in the show. But up next, as always, we'll talk to our good friend Jim Downpool of The Loop at loopinsight.com about his experience with the original iPhone. This is your Mac Life. Welcome back, folks. This is Your Mac Life. I am Sean King, joined, as always, in our phone by our good friend Jim Downpool of The Loop at loopinsight.com. Jim, how you doing? Doing good. How are you? I'm good. Uh, obviously, iPhone is the uh, big news for this week, for this show. Uh, ten years ago tomorrow, the iPhone went on sale. What were you doing ten years ago today? Playing with my iPhone. <laughs> no, you weren't. Yeah, I was. You didn't have one of the original, you weren't one of the original reviewers. I got one the day before it was released. Really? I didn't know that. I thought it was just the Beg, Pogue, Walls, Mossberg, and, and Levy. I didn't realize you got one the day before. All right, so you got yeah. one the day before. What were your initial thoughts on that first iPhone? Uh, it was just amazement, really. Was it Was it amazement, or was it a, why were you amazed by this? I mean, you, you know, you, you've been a, a technology guy for, you know, for Well, because there, there, there wasn't any technology like this. Yeah. You know, so all we were used to with the phone is making calls. <laughs> That's right. You know, and now supposedly you could do all this wonderful stuff, so... At this point, the day before the release, I was sitting in a hotel room in New York um, with my iPhone, yeah. you know, just playing around. The, the um, Who was it? ZDNet. Um, I'll link to it on, on the loop and I'll, I'll pull it up. Uh, posted an interesting story that actually got a lot of people on, on the loop a little ticked off at me about the fact that I was uh, giving props to the guys on uh, ZDNet with regards to the iPhone, The that we didn't see that the iPhone, he thought the iPhone was going to be a piece of crap um, at the time. A lot of folks did. You know, a lot of folks that uh, he, he was surprised as he says, well, I'm still surprised the iPhone didn't die. Do, do you think, looking back in hindsight 10 years, that the iPhone, if we look at it objectively, 
wasn't a very good device 10 years ago today? No, 10 years ago, it was a good device. It was. Yeah. See, if I remember correctly, and I think I do, it was a shitty phone. We all complained about the phone, about the call quality. If you were at a Macworld Expo or in New York City, you had awful call quality. The, the well, same. I still I still can't get reception on any phone in San Francisco. <laughs> so, you know, or New York for that matter. So I don't think it's it's the phone. No, I thought the phone was really good quality for what it was. And I was using Nokia's and Blackberries and everything else. I I thought it was good quality. I mean, we we all have complaints about everything that yeah. we use. You know, I mean, I can, I could uh, uh, complain to you about my TV too. Yeah, uh, they're not going to do any good, and it works. You know, but I could complain to you about it. Um, but but we forget about the fact, little things that that we forget about. I mean, there was no cut and paste until version three of the freaking iPhone. Come on now. Oh, so everybody else had that though. Yeah, it was available in other phones. All those flip phones. It know. doesn't matter whether it was available or not. We're not, not talking about the other phones. We're talking about the iPhone. No. Look, were there things that were wrong with the iPhone? Absolutely. Absolutely there were. I mean, did we want cut and paste? Yeah, most of us didn't know why we wanted it. But <laughs> yeah, we wanted it. I, th- um, I, think, I think the iPhone survived on the enthusiasm of us new users and it carried it forward far enough for Apple to fix a lot of these issues, whether they were just us nerd issues or whether they were real issues, AT and T and phone quality dropping and that kind of stuff. I think that's what happened. If I think if Apple hadn't fixed those issues inside the first year and brought the App Store out, because I think the App Store was the, the killer app of the iPhone, then sure I don't was. think it would have survived. Well, but what would have survived in in that kind of a vacuum? You know, nothing. But the iPhone, I think the iPhone would have survived. Yeah, I can. I, yeah, I really do because it, it did change a lot of things and the way that we think about doing things. Now, the fact that they brought the App Store out, um, you know, that was obviously huge. That was just as huge as the, as the iPhone. Yeah. You know, allowing it to do apps. So, I don't know. Did you go to I, that, did, I, did, did I see you in, at the Fifth Avenue store on on launch day? Yep. Yes, yeah, I did. I remember. I, I I took a picture of you. I think it's the last picture taken of you hairless. Um, it could be. <laughs> could be. Yeah. I still remember. I was watching the video that I had shot for a Mackerel dot com at the time that I've got linked up on loopinsight dot com. I remember the excitement not only in the crowd but even of the apple employees and the media everybody was excited about this thing the the walk from the line down into the 5th avenue store with the whole area lined with on one side hundreds and hundreds literally of media cameras and uh, 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 reporters and on the other side hundreds of apple store employees clapping and applauding you felt like you were at a rock concert it yep. was amazing. I don't believe, and correct me if you think I'm wrong, that we will ever see an event like this ever again for a single device, gadget, object. Well, no, I think we will. I really? Mean, we, we, we always say that, though. You know, well, there'll be never anything like this again, yeah. you know. And, and there is. There always is. So, yeah, there will be. But um, in the phone space, maybe not. Maybe not. It was. A, it was. It truly was a turning point. Oh, absolutely, you know? absolutely. And one of the things, one of the reasons why I think it was a turning point was because I think that, uh, as I was saying before, you you came on the air was the fact that I think that a lot of people misunderstood what the iPhone was. It wasn't a phone. It was a small computer that we could now carry with us wherever we went. And did that just well, happen yeah. to make phone? Did that just happen but to we, make shitty phone calls? We we didn't understand that at no, the time. Though. No, I don't think so. I, and that's what I was saying. I, I wonder if Apple understood that at the time. The sense I've gotten from the interviews that we've seen from uh, insiders, I don't think Apple even had that sense that this well, was going I, to be a small computer and not a phone. I think that they started to realize that when they knew that they had to put out apps, Yeah. then it was like, 
you know, that's a totally different thing. Making yeah. apps for a phone, that's different. It completely flipped the whole uh, phone thing on its head. Not only from the point of view, folks may not realize this 10 years later, but back in the day, and even now to a certain degree for certain companies, the your your cell phone company dictated what the abilities of your phone could do. For example, Correct. at one point, Verizon had blocked Bluetooth on its phones. You could get Bluetooth on AT&T, but you couldn't get Bluetooth, Bluetooth on Verizon phones, which was just bizarre. It was just weird. But Apple flipped that. It gave the power to the handset manufacturers. It also flipped the whole voice versus data thing. We used to be able to get unlimited data and <coughs> and get charged for voice. Now, for a lot of us, we get unlimited voice and get charged for data. Right. Well, because then you couldn't really do anything with data, so they'll give you something for free if yep. you don't use it. But then, all of a sudden, when the iPhone came, we could use data, and the the they were freaking out like yeah. holy shit nobody's making phone calls <laughs> and that's right. that, you know for a while i had bluetooth headsets with my iphone that i used to wear i get up in the morning and put in my bluetooth headset and it'd be in there all day long yeah um and you know when uh, i don't know when it was really over the years i i don't need a bluetooth headset anymore mm -hmm. Because I rarely make phone calls. I mean, you're you're one of my only calls of the week. <laughs> that's right. You yeah, know? that's that's pretty much it too for, for for me. I mean, this is the only regular phone call I make. I'll the only other call I ever make is to my internet service provider saying, "Why is my service down?" That's pretty much it. Yeah, I I just I don't make calls. The other thing that the that I I know that Apple didn't see coming was the rise of photography. Apple, I think, is the driving force behind this whole push to document our lives, to photograph our lives. I don't know if we did selfies as much or the way we do them now. I think it's all because of the iPhone. It's estimated that because of the iPhone, I saw in a stat from the moment we first invented for, first invented photography until 2016, we'd taken a trillion photos. We took a trillion in 2016 alone. Yeah. We are taking so many more photos. People who never thought of themselves as photographers, good, bad, or indifferent, are now taking photographs three, four, five, six, seven times a day. Whereas before, you wouldn't take a photo every six months. Yeah, that's true. And because of that, it's killing other aspects of the camera industry. I mean, point and shoots are almost dead. I don't think they, I don't think they'll ever go away completely, but they're almost dead. Why now, won't they go away? Because there's still specific use cases for point and shoots. Uh, one of the things I always tell folks is I'm not going to mount my iPhone to my motorcycle. I can do a point and shoot to there. I'm not going to take my iPhone underwater. I can with a point and shoot. I'm not going to take it skiing. You know, in adverse conditions, the a point and shoot can be a, a better camera than the iPhone. Well, why wouldn't you use a GoPro? Because the GoPro is. Uh, let me see. Why wouldn't I use a GoPro? Because I don't think of a GoPro as a camera. I think of it, sorry as a picture camera. I think of it as a video camera. I know it takes pictures. I don't. It's not thought of as a picture taking camera though. Why don't you just change your thought of it and get a GoPro? Because I don't want either. <laughs> I don't. I don't want to point. I don't want to point and shoot or a a, a GoPro. I don't, I'm not taking well, video. Well, why why do you have something strapped onto your bike then? For those occasions when I do want to be able to um, shut up. What are you interviewing me for? <laughs> you won't let me on your podcast. Screw you. You don't uh... interview me on mine. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so so the, the iPhone has, has really um, destroyed that aspect of the industry. The other thing is the, the, the velocity of sales of the iPhone. For those folks who are watching the video, I posted up this... Um, Wall Street Journal graphic that it took Toyota 50 years to sell less than, say, 10 million Corollas. Uh, Zippo lighters uh, took 80 years to sell 0.6 billion lighters. Barbie dolls took 60 years to sell a billion Barbie dolls. The iPhone has sold 1.2 billion in less than 10 years. 
It's the fastest selling device in the history of mankind. Its trajectory is amazingly vertical when it comes to sales. More of these things have been sold than any other single object. Well, it was just the right time for that device. Mm -hmm. It was perfect. The timing could not have been any better. I think the weirdest stat I saw was that iPhones have changed, have um, uh, de not destroyed, but adversely affected the sale of gum. What? <laughs> iPhones have changed gum sales. For better or worse? For worse, 15%. Uh, gum sales have declined 15% since 2007, the year the iPhone came out. Why? Well, how, how, why is that the iPhone's fault? This is weird, and it, it kind of makes sense. Supermarket checkout lines were for a long time a major point of sale for gum. Consumers waiting in line to pay would look around and make impulse buys. Now, huh. we're so consumed huh. with our phones, we're not reaching for a pack of gum to save off boredom. Wow. <laughs> but that is true, isn't it? I wonder how the iPhones affected things like magazine sales at airports. Because back in the day, you know, you'd go to the airport an hour or two hours early, and then you had time to kill. You'd go to the, 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 the magazine news rack, and you'd buy a copy of Car and Driver or, or, or Macworld or some magazine and go sit and read the magazine. Now, you just pull out your iPhone. It's true. I've often wondered... So I want to. I want to. I want to call Wrigley's gum and ask them how much stock they own in Apple. <laughs> I've often they wondered. Have to how, be offsetting that. Yeah, somehow, exactly. They got to do it somehow. I've often wondered how the iPhone is affecting things like tipping. You go to Starbucks back in the day, and you'd buy your coffee. It was a buck seventy-five. You gave the leftover quarter in the tip jar to the the barista. Well, now we're using iPhones to pay for things. I'm not tipping anymore. I'm not giving that physical quarter to a barista anymore. I'm keeping it. Yeah, it's true. It, it's amazing how many different ways the iPhone over the last 10 years is affecting not just Apple as a company, it's now the, the world's most valuable company, but the way we do things, the way we do simple things like standing in line at a checkout counter. Yeah, I never thought of that. I really did not think of that. Are you going to the bathroom? No, I emptied a pot in the sink, dumbass. <laughs> I just wanted to check to make sure. Jeez. I don't know with you. you That's something you would do. If I mentioned that to someone, they would say, yeah, I can see Jim doing that. No, they wouldn't. The other upside and downside aspect of the iPhone is... This fact, the fact that we have this always-on device that's connecting us not only to family and friends, but to our jobs, too. It's hard to beg off a work emergency if you have these devices, not just the iPhone, but obviously any other kind of device. But that would also mean it means you can be contacted anywhere, anytime. I don't know if that's a good thing or bad thing overall, though. Well, and that's kind of why we need to take a break sometimes, isn't it? Yeah. You know, well, when I you mean, go, I, when you go on vacation, do you take your iPhone? Do you still check email? Well, I don't go on vacation, so yeah. The problem, that, but, and, well, the problem is yeah. for you, you can't because you're in the news business. You you can't afford to take a week off and ignore the news. If I did, uh, well, I have traveled in the past, yeah, and and yes, I have taken my iPhone with me most definitely. Uh, yeah. But have Definitely. you have you left have you ever left your laptop behind and only used your iPhone while you're traveling? No. Yeah, that's that's a whole. We'll we'll get into that in in a second. But but it is possible for a lot of folks. For, I'll wait. I'm washing a pot. My God. <laughs> do, you, do you not believe? Do you want to hear? Do you want to hear the the carburetor? See, there's the carburetor. <laughs> <laughs> Just so you know. Oh, why is mine the only podcast you do this shit on? Huh? I listen to another podcast, and you're quiet and respectful, and the and the sound quality is good. There's no birds in the background. There's no kids. There's, but for me, you got to jerk me around. 
Why is that? I, I, I'm not doing that. I just needed to wash a pot. No, you don't I need only, to wash a pot in the middle of the show. I only have one pot. <laughs> so, yeah, I needed to wash a pot. Scott sort of said, yeah, but he's not drunk on other podcasts either. Well, that's true, too. No, that's, good, that's, good, that good is actually, that's mostly true. <laughs> mostly true yeah which device being sold today this is our friend jan dawson on twitter which device sold today do you think will have the same impact in the next 10 years as the iphone had in the past 10 years none hmm i think the only thing i can think of that would have that kind of impact is in general electric cars i think electric cars will have a huge electric and or self-driving autonomous vehicles in the next 10 years. I think that's the only thing possible because you have to find a device or think of a device that everybody wants or uses. Well, the only problem with the electric cars is that I almost said guitars. <laughs> the only problem with electric cars is that they're so expensive. So yes. not everybody is going to buy those. When you look at something like the iPhone, that it the electric car doesn't actually physically change the way that we drive we still kind of drive the same way except for the morons that sit in the back no. um, but the iphone really changed the way that we communicate and changed the way that we work mm -hmm. so i i don't think that the electric car will do that type of thing so i I really don't think that there's anything out right now that is going to make the type of fundamental change in our lifestyles that like the iPhone did. The iPhone certainly has affected more people than an electric car would directly. I think electric cars will indirectly affect just as many, but directly as, as you said, ownership wise, even though, well, the, I, even though the iPhones are expensive, they're not $35,000 expensive. The other thing that, um, uh, that you have to consider is at one point I was concerned about, uh, climate change but apparently that's not really a thing <laughs> so you know i'm just gonna go get an old diesel something or other and just smoke up the whole place you know get an old dump truck and yep yeah but i i think i think that it has it has the potential maybe over a longer period of time the other thing is i don't the only thing i can think of is maybe ar but nowhere near the effect that uh, the iphone did I, I can't I, I can't see that right now. Yeah. Maybe it will. You know, maybe in ten years you'll come and say you said that nothing would. Well AR was just being released at that time and look how big it is now. See what it's done for us. If if in ten years I have a hollow deck, <laughs> I will I will gladly say that you you were correct. John Kirk said the iPhone changed everything. There's almost no aspect of our lives that has hasn't altered. At least for those of us in the West, and certainly for those of us who are techie, that's absolutely true. Uh, the, I, my iPhone is never more than arm's reach away from me. It's the only device I think of that most of us, if we forgot at home, would turn around and go back and get. Right. You know, if, if, I, if, I, if I worked at an office and forgot my office keys, I'd still go to the office and, and wait for someone to open the door. But I have gone back to get my iPhone. Well, you think about it, though, with, uh, like John says, it changed everything that we do. Yep. So um, you can do almost everything that you need to do on an iPhone if you had to. So if I was at a, an airport and I had to write a story, I could. Yep. I don't want to. Believe me, I don't want to, but I could. Uh, I can make phone calls. I can text. I can communicate in, you know, a hundred different ways on on the iPhone. Uh, to anybody in the world, yeah. pretty much. So as long as I have that with me and I'm not running a beta that chews up the battery, I I feel pretty comfortable that I can get done whatever it is that I need to get done. The other aspect of it that a lot of us don't uh, think about or realize is how many other things, not just the iPhone and Apple, but look at what it did to AT&T. AT&T spent tens of billions of dollars upgrading the network and therefore forced Verizon and Sprint and T-Mobile to upgrade their networks. It drove the development of phones in a different direction, I believe, at all these other companies. 
it gave rise to a lot of Chinese manufacturers who saw this gold rush that people wanted to spend money on these devices. Um, even if you've never used an iPhone in your life, it's affected your life. If you have an Android phone, um, a lot of the things that happen there are, are uh, as a direct result of things that Apple does. It, it has driven so much of, at least here in the West, and certainly even in developed countries. I hear a lot of really interesting stories of how people in developed countries don't have computers, but they've got we are, a we computer are in, in developed their hands. countries. So we are in developed countries. Developing countries, uh, where even if it's an Android phone, they're able to run their business on these smartphones that I don't believe would have gotten to where they are today if it hadn't been for the iPhone 10 years ago. No. No. We still would have been dictated to by the uh, uh, carriers. Yeah. Well, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, if e Even if nothing else changed, that would have been still true. The the carriers still would be forcing us to do what they wanted us to do as opposed to <coughs> hopefully what customers want more so than is now. It's going to be interesting. It's interesting to see. Now, the, next, the final question is, will Apple commemorate this come – their next iPhone launch? Do you think there will be a either a special iPhone or a different iPhone coming up in September, October? Well, I think that they'll keep their iPhone launches the way that they have. Yeah. But they, they may mention it. Yeah. That's, I don't I don't think there's gonna be do. Yeah, I don't think there's gonna be an anniversary iPhone. I don't think we're I don't think we're gonna see a special colored iPhone or anything else along those lines. I think I think they will, obviously. I think they'll mention it tomorrow. I think tomorrow's Apple Apple's website will be a different website commemorating the launch. And then in September, when they announce the new iPhones, they'll definitely mention it. But I, I, a lot of folks are hoping for or thinking there's going to be a special edition iPhone uh, 10th anniversary. Just, I don't it's think not so. the way Apple does things. No. No, I agree. It's not. I mean, I'm, there, you'd be lucky to get a mention in the keynote about an anniversary. Of that. <laughs> Let's move you know? on now. Uh, folks, by the way, if you have any questions or comments about this kind of stuff, uh, send, send me an email to onair at yourmaclifeshow.com. Love to hear what you guys were doing uh, 10 years ago today. There was a big stink um, over, and I, as I said on the, I think the pre-show, or the, this is going to be the last time that you and I, Jim, ever discussed this iPod, iPad as a laptop replacement. Is this argument silly? Yes. Why? Well, because for you, it might not be a replacement. For me, it might be. So yep. who, who the hell are you to tell me that it's not a replacement or that it is? I mean, it, it depends on the person. And those arguments that Oh, this is not a laptop replacement. It's a it's a sucky laptop. Well, it's not a laptop. Yeah. But but there are a great deal of many people out there who can use an iPad as a computer. And I'm not talking about the the techie idiots that that write that you know all this stuff that it's not a laptop replacement. Yeah. Look at the the number of normal everyday people that could use an ipad as a computer mm -hmm. and there are plenty of them doing it so for somebody anybody to come out and say definitively this is not a laptop replacement yep. well you, you're just being an arrogant dick and i think that's the problem i have with it too is that this latest one is uh, generally in response to a Jason Tobolsky, uh, tweet storm where he says, at what point, if you think Josh. you, sorry, uh, Joshua Tobolsky, if you think you can replace your laptop with an iPad, you cannot. That's just a, a definitive blanket statement. That's utterly ridiculous and stupid Yep. because he's not me. He's not you. He's him. Now, if he says that I can't replace my laptop with, with an iPad, I'll give you that. But okay. him trying to say that everybody can't do that is to me, and he's generally supposed to be a smart guy, but that's going to be one of the dumbest things he's ever written. Yeah. Yep. There are all kinds of people out there, not only the famous, semi-famous in the Macintosh community, like like Federico Vitici over at MacStories.net, who famously is probably the least, the most well-known person who only uses an iPad 
to do his work. But there's all kinds of folks who do all kinds of fun things using just an iPad. We see these stories all the time of how somebody bought their grandmother uh, an iPad. They didn't buy her, buy her a laptop. And now grandma right. reads and sends pictures off to the grandkids and, and blogs. FaceTimes. And does, yeah, FaceTimes does all kinds of cool stuff that she could yeah. have done on a laptop too. That In that case, that iPad for that person in that situation is in fact a replacement. You're absolutely right. And that's where this whole argument falls apart. But yep. then they say, oh, well, I meant for doing real work. Real work. Well, that's right. Well, I'm sorry. Uh, what kind of real work do, do you actually do that yep. can't be done there? Because there are plenty of artists that do real work on, on an iPad. There are people that record on an iPad. Um, you, you know, so you type and you can't do that on an iPad. Yep. Um, not, that makes no sense to me, but I will say, like Gruber said, given the choice, I would rather type on my MacBook than I would on an iPad. Absolutely. But I'm old school yep, too. That's right. So I've been using a Mac a lot longer than I've been using an iPad. And that is where my comfort level is mm -hmm. right now. Now, when I go in a after talking to you, chances are, if I'm going to pick anything up, It'll be my iPad, not yep. my computer, because the day's you know closing out, and this is this is the way that the evening is going to go. So you know, but that's how I use my iPad right now. Is there going to be a time in in the the future when my MacBook will be an iPad? Could be, could be. Don't know. I think that's an interesting uh, thing too. Is that the iPad? And I agree with you in, in that sense. The iPad is oftentimes for me a time of day thing and a where I am physically thing. If I'm um, if I'm sitting on uh, the couch, yes, I'm going to use my iPad. If I'm sitting in bed, lying in bed and reading, yes, I'll, I'll use my iPad. But if I'm sitting at a desk, I want my laptop or in my case, my 27 inch iMac to well, do to do well, my, my work on. And let's not forget, if you had told me 15 years ago that my main computer would be a laptop, I would have said you were crazy. Yeah, true. Yeah. Because I, I am going to use this uh, Mac Pro or G4, or G3 uh, computer, and I need that power. And, and there's no way, no way that I will ever use a laptop as my main computer yeah. because the battery isn't good enough and... Uh, all I need the portability for is when I travel. Yeah. And when I pick up that 15-pound uh, bag with all my stuff in it, then I'll travel. But other than that, no way you're ever going to get me to use a laptop. And what do I use now? Mostly a laptop. Yep. yep. And for and me – go ahead. And I, and I have a 27-inch iMac that I use for music. So. Yep. Yeah, it's just one of those things where you can't make that blanket statement. There are some things where you can, but in this regard, Topolsky saying things like what I quoted, and then he followed it up with um, the new iPad in iOS 11 is inferior to a laptop in almost every way unless you like the draw. Again, that's just idiotic. Yeah. And, and, and it, from someone who, who I may, may not respect but certainly should know better, and shouldn't say things that uh, maybe he's doing it to get the buzz. Maybe he's doing it to get more attention to himself and, and the outline, his his new website. Maybe that's what he's doing it for. But it, it's surprising that Topolsky would say something that remarkably dumb. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I couldn't have said it any better myself. Did you uh, watch that video, Apple's Planet of the Apps is even worse than you thought? I did. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good rip. That was a good uh, rip. I yeah, got. I got to uh, say that they, they they nailed it. The only part I didn't agree with it was the very beginning when they said, "Oh, and you do it on an iPad, and you do it on an Apple device, and then you do." Well, of course you do. Yeah, I mean, that's right. You know, but other than that, yeah, they were bang on. Yeah, it is an awful show, and it, it is awful. It's, and and what what is it that you're learning from Will I Am? He will steal half of your company. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> he, he, that, and, that's what you learn. And from you learn, I'm... and you learn from the the video that Gwyneth Paltrow and her goop thing. She has no idea what the hell she's talking about. That no. that um, uh, Jessica Alba 
and her supposedly uh, natural, heuristic, holistic company is full of shit. Is, is not. And, and, it's, and, the com- and the company is called Honest. Yeah, exactly. Oh, Jesus. And the VC guy is typical of most people in Silicon Valley. He's just full of himself, and all he wants to do is me, me, me. Yeah. So, so uh, listening to any of those people would be like uh, me telling you I'm 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 on my, on my first beer. You know. <laughs> I know you're lying. Oh yeah, I'm <laughs> on my first beer. No, 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 no doubt about it. No doubt That's about right. it. That's right. Folks, been talking to Jim Downpour of the Loop at LoopInsight.com. He's here each and every week. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Sean. Talk to you later. Bye bye. Bye. Yeah, send me your emails. Uh, what were your initial thoughts on uh, the iPhone, or what was your initial experience with the iPhone uh, 10 years ago tomorrow? Did you stand in line? Were you one of those people at your local Apple store waiting patiently with $700 burning in your pocket, waiting to give it to Apple? Like I said, I, I wouldn't have done it uh, if it hadn't been for Macworld hiring me to go to uh, the line in New York City because, yeah. I, 700 bucks for a phone? That's insane. I don't need a phone that bad. It's just a phone. Blah, blah, blah. And I knew immediately after I was wrong that it wasn't just because I'm like a lot of people, and let's generalize here, a lot of guys, I don't talk, on, I don't like to talk on the phone for long periods of time, and I don't use the phone very often, not only 10 years ago, but even now. So if it was just going to be a cool phone, I didn't care. But it wasn't until... I got the thing in my hand, and it felt wonderful. I, th- I think the original iPhone, even though it was heavy, the physicalness of it felt the best of anyone because it, it had enough thickness, you could feel it in your hand, and it had that curve on it. I love the, the, the tactile sensation of that original iPhone. The screen was great, but for me, it was the browsing. It was the ability to, I always tell this story, that I was standing outside of a bar, in a small town in Connecticut, having a cigarette. And this guy walks by me, and he's British. And he says to me, hey, mate, do you happen to know the country code for the UK? And I'm like, what the hell kind of question is that? No, I don't. Oh, hang on. I pull up my iPhone. I go to Google. I do a search for country code UK. And it comes up with 011. I said to the guy, 011. Thanks, mate. And off he goes and went, that was cool. And for me, someone like me who's an information junkie who constantly wants to ingest information in 8,000 different kinds of ways, who is always reading, who's always wanting information being entered into my skull, having access to the world of information that was, the, that was and is the internet to me was incredible. That was the best part about the iPhone, not the phone part. Not the contacts, not even the app store in the beginning. It was the fact that I could have the world's information at my fingertips to answer any question I ever might have. That's the way I thought about it. And that's when I knew the iPhone was going to be huge, was when I realized that's what this thing could do. It could give me all the world's information in my hand. Scott Thrift said the best thing for me was having a phone I could actually type on. The keyboard and the BlackBerry was impossible with my giant man hands. I didn't, I had a BlackBerry. Um, maybe your hand, man hands or giant man hands are bigger than mine. But I found, at least in the beginning, it was easier to type on the BlackBerry after muscle memory kicked in. I saw people who were so good on Blackberries, they didn't have to look at the keyboard. Just very much like, like touch typists. If you ever got the opportunity to, to watch our IRC Babe Sly uh, touch type, she does like 110 words a minute. With, never, never looks at the keyboard. Just and I was pretty good with my two thumbs on a BlackBerry. I don't think I ever got that fast on the iPhone, but it is, it's different than typing on a BlackBerry. And the trade-offs <clears throat> between a hard physical keyboard and a BlackBerry versus the iPhone I'm okay with the trade-off in the sense that very much like Steve Jobs originally said was that the, 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 whatever space you're using for keys is space you can't use for screen is space you can't use for anything else. And you're going to have things on the screen that that keyboard can't be used with. So that means the keyboard is useless. 
I think Apple's implementation of this was genius. Even though a lot of us didn't like it in the beginning, and some folks still don't like it, and a lot of folks still can't touch type on it. I don't know anyone who can type on the iPhone without looking at it. My muscle memory still hasn't kicked in well enough. I still look. I can type pretty quickly on it. And the, the, uh, the typo correction is pretty damn good on the iPhone. It's still not as, for me, fast as I could on a BlackBerry. But given what I got in return, that giant screen on the iPhone where there is no longer that um, keyboard taking up, what, a third of your screen? Now I could have this whole thing be screen? I'm okay with that. That was an okay trade-off for me. Scott Thrift says, I used to be able to SMS on my old Nokia 5110 without looking. Yeah, if you, if you could get the muscle memory on your physical keyboard, it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't a hard thing to do to be a very, very fast typist on those kinds of things. Send me your emails to Sean at yourmaclifeshow.com, and I'll see. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about more of this on uh, this show and on next week's show and wherever else you guys send me emails. On tonight's starting point photography segment, uh, I got a, uh, my good friend uh, Vito Mori sent along one of his friends uh, sent a question off to Vito, and Vito said, "Hey, ask Sean on the fa- his Facebook page, Ralph Barone. Ralph, I hope I'm saying your hope I'm saying your name correctly. Ralph was asking about moving up from a point and shoot camera and an iPhone to a DSLR, a real camera." He says, hi, Sean, I've asked these questions on my Facebook page. I'm contemplating moving up from a point-and-shoot camera and my iPhone to a real replaceable lens digital camera. I really don't want to over-research the topic, and I'm not planning on buying top-of-the-line gear. If people want to try answering these questions for me, I would really appreciate it. Question number one from Ralph. He says, what are the broad differences between the major brands out there? Ralph Broadly, short version, none. If you if this is going to be your first DSLR, it doesn't matter which one you buy. It doesn't matter whether you buy a Canon, a Nikon, an Olympus, a Pentax. It doesn't matter. If you're a beginning digital photographer and don't know much about digital photography, about if you don't know what aperture is and what it does, what ISO is and what it does, what shutter speed, all that kind of stuff, if you don't know that stuff, then it's not going to make any difference. Even if you know that stuff, the differences in the major manufacturers are, I'd argue, fairly minuscule, very, very specific. For example, if you were a, a landscape shooter, there's a particular kind of camera you'd buy. If you were a sports shooter, there's a particular kind of camera you'd buy. If you're a wedding photographer or a portrait photographer, there's a, typical, a, a particular kind of lens that you would get. But unless you're a very specific kind of photographer, all of the general camera manufacturers make really good beginner cameras. So don't get caught up in those kinds of things. The only thing I would suggest, and it's kind of funny that, that that I would suggest this is that, um, if you have a friend who's got a large lens collection and he'll loan you lenses buy his brand of camera, (laughs) So if you've got a friend that's got a Canon and you've got a bunch of different lenses, you buy a Canon too. So you can borrow his lenses. That's the only thing I would say is why you have to buy one brand over another. Number two, are digital cameras still improving at such a high rate that only buying new makes sense? Or has the rate of development slowed down to the point where used gear can be a better value? That's a good question. Um, Again, as a beginner... It's more important that you learn about the concepts of photography than it is about specific functionality of a camera. So therefore, I would say any camera you would buy made in the last two to three years will last you the next five years. Sensor technology moves forward. Um, Autofocus speed moves forward. Uh, Camera uh, uh, manufacturing techniques move forward but not to the degree that a beginner would notice. For amateur, sorry, for pros, yes. 
So, for example, um, if you were a cannon shooter, uh, last year Nikon came out with a Nikon D5. And a lot of cannon shooters who were sports shooters, because that's what they shoot. They shot, they shoot high-speed sports stuff, sold their cannon gear and bought the new Nikon gear because the difference was that much for them. But it wouldn't be for the average person. So, yeah, anything, anything even if you buy used gear, two to three, two to three years old, you're still going to get a very, very good camera. What are the minimum technical terms I need to know? Eh, Learn about th- um, two things. Composition, that's the most important thing in photography. And this thing called the exposure triangle. But get your composition down first. Composition is the most important thing in photography. Start taking well-composed images. The next thing is this exposure triangle. And it's uh, aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. Those are the three legs of the triangle that are important probably the minimum technical stuff you're going to want to know and finally ralph says if you had to buy a beginner kit today what would it be if i was going to buy beginner gear today it depends on whether you were going to shoot whether you wanted to shoot uh, mirrorless or dslr if i'm going to shoot dslr buy um the Canon Rebel line, I think it's the TSI now, but basically it's called the Rebel line, or the Nikon D33 or 3400 line. Those are the best beginner full-size DSLRs. If you're going to go mirrorless, don't get the Canon or the Nikon. Get something from Fuji, Sony, or Olympus. Those are the three, in my opinion, the three best companies to buy mirrorless designs for. So I wrote, I wrote those answers to Ralph on Facebook, and he said, your answers are great, but of course they just raise the next set of questions. So, DSLR, mirrorless, or super zoom all in one? What are good criteria to help me drive one way or the other? And that's a great follow-up question, Ralph, because... It's the idea of what kind of photographer are you? Do you like shooting people's faces? That's one kind of camera. Do you like shooting action? The kids running around? That's a different kind of camera. Do you like shooting um, wildlife? It's a different kind of camera. You know what I'm saying? So it depends on what kind of photography that you want to do dictates the kind of camera and gear you'll want to get. Now, let's say you don't know. If you don't know what kind of photographer you are, look at your iPhone. Look at what kind of shots you take with your iPhone. Do you see a lot of landscape photos in there? A lot of still life? A lot of people? That'll help you see what kind of photographer you might want to be. When it comes to whether you get a DSLR or mirrorless or an all-in-one, that's just a price point thing, I think. Um, it's also a physical size thing. DSLRs are bigger than mirrorless in general and all in ones. So if there's an issue of physical size, otherwise get what you can afford because this won't be your last camera. Uh, what'll happen is hopefully you'll enjoy taking pictures and you'll progress into more and better cameras. Ralph, thanks very much for the uh, question. I really appreciate it. I got uh, uh, Bobby B in the IRC chat room says, this seems to be the same question every week. Well, it's not. I mean, we've talked about ISO and street photography and all kinds of stuff over the last little while. Uh, It's my thing. The same which camera should I buy every week seems odd. Well, uh, I'd like to know why Sean does this show. Well, you could always send me an email, Bobby, and I could answer the question. Uh, Scott Thrift backs me up says, Sean's been doing the show for many years. Been a staple of the Mac podcast community. Always fun and informative. I don't know about that. Um, Mark MacMac says, uh, did Sean or anyone else talk about trying iOS 11? Not yet, Mark. Um, I, I'm not a beta tester for Apple anymore. I, I, don't, I don't beta test stuff anymore. I've got more important things to do than, than work with buggy software. I, I, don't, um, I don't have a backup iPhone that I would put iOS 11 on. I don't have a backup iPad. I would put iOS 11 on. 
I don't have a backup. I do have a backup laptop that I would put iOS, sorry, I would put Sierra on, high Sierra. I can't be bothered. It's not that important to me. I'll read other people's reviews, but I, I myself haven't, uh, haven't tried a, the, those new, new OSs. I just, like I said, I'm, I'm no longer willing to be a beta tester for, for Apple. Paul says the question, uh, the focus ring or focus motor of my uh, 1855 lens and my dirty D3300 is not working. I've tried manual focus, LV mode, focus is not working. Help me. Problem is, Paul, if it's the 1855, that's the kit lens. If the focus ring or motor on your kit lens is broken, fixing it is going to cost more than the lens. It's just not worth it. Um, you could probably go on eBay or Craigslist and get another 1855 uh, kit lens camera for under 100 bucks. I think that would be a better idea than trying to fix the focus ring or focus motor on a kit lens lens. Our friend Jason Painter in Sydney, Australia says, I recently tried a couple of settings you mentioned. It's been beneficial. Back button autofocus seems more efficient than shutter autofocus where you press the shutter halfway. At night, during the recent Vivid Sydney event, I was able to press the shutter without having to wait for autofocus every time. I always thought that setting my Nikon to black and white would produce black and white raw photos. I don't want this, in case I want color. I tested it, and it just displays black and white in the camera, like you mentioned. I can process them as color if I want. Great tip. Well, you're welcome, Jason. For those folks who who forgot what I told, we were talking about... um, Bobby was asking, it's the same show every week. It's not. Bobby, last week we were talking about black and white photography. Um, you can have, you can set your camera to show on your display, on the rear display of your camera, monochrome images. You're not taking the shot in monochrome. You're looking at it in the viewfinder in monochrome. I think that's better than taking pictures in color and then changing them to black and white in software. I want to see the shots here in black and white so I can see if I need to change my composition or change the angle or change the light or those kinds of things rather than waiting till I get back home and on the computer. So read your manual if you have to, but, but see if you can shoot in, um, in black and white on the camera as opposed to changing it later on. Uh, Tanya says she's looking at buying a new DSLR. Is it safe to buy DSLRs from wholesalers? Well, Tanya, I don't know which wholesaler you're talking about. Um, if you're talking about Costco and those kinds of folks, yeah. Uh, Costco will sell you brand new, but generally older models of cameras. Um, I've seen people buy Costco cameras, really good deals, but it's a two-year-old camera. So if that's not a problem for you, you can go ahead and buy from Costco and those kind of places. Um, I don't tell, I, I, I tell folks not to buy online for the most part, unless you already know what you want. For example, if you've never used a Canon camera, don't buy it online. Go to your local camera store or your local Best Buy and physically pick the camera up and see what feels in your hand. Until you know <clears throat> what kind of cameras you like, Like, I like Nikons. I'm used to where the Nikon buttons are. I can buy a Nikon camera online from um, B&H Photo in New York City or Adorama or Amazon even, or even Nikon online. But I don't recommend it unless you already know that you're going to like that camera. This is a perfect example. This is a wonderful uh, Olympus uh, M1. Great camera, great mirrorless camera. But if I had gone just by the specs of this camera, if I just gone to someone's review site and said, wow, this, has got a, this camera's got great specs, I'll buy it, and then bought it, I would have been very disappointed because physically the camera is very small for my hands. My D600, my whole hand fits in here, but on this one, just these two fingers fit in the camera grip, and I don't like that. I'm also not crazy about the size of the buttons on the M1. I find them very small and fidgety. Whereas I like the size of the buttons on my D600. So if you're unfamiliar with the camera uh, manufacturer and style, don't buy it sight unseen. The other thing is folks in the IRC chat room are are picking up on, 
Um, if MacMan says, if the price seems too good to be true, it's a scam. Do not buy online from any company whose name you don't recognize. If you go to Amazon and the price of that camera is $500, but you find it on Joe's camera shop for $200, that's going to be what's called either a gray box or black market. And you probably won't get a warranty. You probably won't get a manual or a strap or even a battery. Maybe not even get a lens with those ones. People get ripped off on those things all the time. Do not buy from not even disreputable, but sites that you don't recognize the name of. I only buy online from companies that I know I've used, other people use, people recognize. Amazon, B&H Photo, Adorama. What other online sites would you folks trust to buy camera gear? Uh, I bought my D600 um, sight unseen on Amazon because I knew I liked Nikons. Um, I knew I liked the specs on it. So I um, will happily buy another Nikon from, from an online source. But if I wanted to switch to um, a different model, a different brand, I want to physically feel it first. MacMan suggests Newegg. He got his D90 from them. Um, Monty says, I have a couple of gray market lenses I bought in the U.S. Virgin Islands when I was on a cruise. But I knew what I was getting into and was fine with it for the difference in price. That's good. Bobby says, what happened to the photo trip to Portugal? Did anyone go? No, the company that was supposed to be finding people didn't. <sighs> very, very frustrating on my part. Um, hang on, what's this one? Oh, Jeff. Sorry, Jeff. I uh, couldn't find your name in the lid. Now I've lost your email. Hang on, Jeff. Hang on, buddy. There we go. Jeff says, uh, what's better for a beginner, Nikon or Canon? Doesn't matter. Which model? Doesn't matter. If you're a beginner, just buy a camera. Just get, get a camera, get it in your hands, start using it, start understanding how to take pictures. It doesn't matter whether you're shooting Nikon or Canon. It, they're, they're all going to be good. All going to be good. Uh, Mark Pullman in South Carolina says, listen to the archive. Thanks for reading my question and responding. You introduced me to the concept of editorial use. I often wondered how the local TV station could walk into a high school sporting event, tape an underage student doing a sport, and read the student's name in the TV news, all without permission from anyone. Yes, that's editorial use. I happened to talk to our school's director of sports, and he said the students sign a waiver stating that by participating in a sport, they will be subject to the news, taking pictures and videos, and the school cannot be held responsible. That waiver is unnecessary, uh, Mark. Um, it's the school covering their own ass. But as long as it's editorial, I can shoot. If I'm going to use it in an editorial sense as reporting, the school um, doesn't need that waiver from students. The only thing that the school could say is because the school is ostensibly private property, they could prevent the media from coming in and filming or taping the game. Absent that, if the school allows the media to bring their gear in to the gym. The students have no control over that. They don't have a, a reasonable expectation of privacy. You're playing a, a game that the public is invited to come and watch. Therefore, the news media can also report on that. As I said, it seems we're on the same page for understanding the laws of picture taking. I was just curious. Also, I like the Opus Penguin with the color red iPod in your back background. <laughs> he said... I know that you have a liking for penguins and wanted to give people something to look at besides you in the video feed. That's exactly it. Reminds me of a pseudo rock band we created for a high school talent contest. We thought the stage looked empty with only us, but someone had a suitcase of stuffed penguins we also had on stage. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not the only one who thinks having penguins is a stage prop but of higher entertainment value than other inanimate objects. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Sidric the Viking. Uh, first, I check Rotten Tomatoes before I go to any cinema release. If the rating is below 50% by both critics and private commenters, I usually give the cinema a miss and wait for it to arrive on disc or Netflix. Generally, having watched some low-rated films later, I've been happy with the guidance I've been given. As for iWork, I'm a regular Pages and Keynote user. I have hardly ever used Excel, so Numbers has no appeal for me. I only use Word or PowerPoint if there's no way to use Apple's options. I'm really interested to see if I'll use these new shapes. 
I played around with them in Keynote when I updated last night. They look quite useful, but only time will tell. There's quite a collection. This is a, a comment. Uh, this is from uh, Neil McCarthy, I think, or Cedric the Viking, one of the two. Um, this was a comment from a story I posted on uh, loopinsight.com. I didn't realize how many people actually took Rotten Tomato scores to heart. I never have. Um, I'm, I've never bothered to uh, to to say, oh, there's Mark MacMac in the uh, IRC channel. You're welcome for the clarification, Mark. Uh, Terry Scherter says, listening to the show last week, in case no one told you it should be Baby Bear, not Goldilocks. Papa Bear too big, Mama Bear too small, Baby Bear just right. <laughs> Thanks very much. I appreciate that. Uh, this is a follow-up for from uh, WWDC. Sean Kruger wanted to chime in. Said I couldn't agree more about Apple's crack marketing team. As Craig said, they need to be fired or at least taken out back and flogged. Hi Sierra, kind of lame. Stoner jokes, really? You're the biggest company in the world, Apple. The juvenile humor just falls flat. HomePod, great product, bad name. Look at some of the Harman Kardon speakers that Apple has sold over the years in their stores. Four hundred and seven hundred dollars is not uncommon for a great speaker. I have an okay AirPlay speaker on top of my kitchen cabinet and love it. If I were in the market for a new one, I'd get the HomePod. All around, great keynote. I didn't feel like it was too rushed, just a lot of content. A little disappointed that the MacBook Pro RAM still tops out at 16 gigabytes. I thought Cabby Lake was the one thing that was going to bring that up. And I should clarify, I don't need 32 gigs of RAM. I just want people to shut the fuck up about only having 16 gigs of RAM. <laughs> that iMac Pro is gorgeous. I want one. I have no justification whatsoever. If they will sell me the Space Gray accessories, at least I'll get those. It's interesting. I wonder if Apple will sell the Space Gray keyboard and mouse separately from the iMac Pro. I bet they won't. I bet they won't. Glad that we finally have a wireless extended keyboard with a number pad. Can't believe it took so long. As for message, as for iMessage payments, my coworkers use Square Cash. For paying for lunch and whatnot all the time, I'd use iMessage Apple Pay. I think a lot of folks will, will do that. I think we'll see that's going to be a big deal using Apple Pay in iMessage. Also, the reticular focus circle thing that used to be in SLR focus screens. Yes, I missed that so much. I've stopped griping about it because it has been so long. There are times when the autofocus struggles where I just can't see well enough in the viewfinder to tell minute focus differences. Some cameras allow you to change focus screens, but usually just different grid patterns and such. I'd buy one of these if it were offered as an option. I bought a matte focusing screen for one of my Canons a while back, but it wasn't the same thing. This is from Sean Kruger. I wonder why they took that reticular focusing ring out of cameras. Because, yeah, I find, especially as as uh, Sean said, in situations where where autofocus just isn't in low contrast situations, where autofocus isn't isn't getting it, Having that that reticular focusing target thing would, would be a huge help. I'd love to have that on a on a camera. Um reading the IRC chat room. Scott Thrift says, see if you can send an email to Sean with the photo to show us all before he finishes. What 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 what? <laughs> Monty says Rotten Tomatoes loved gravity they lost all credibility with that Monty is still on this gravity thing he hated gravity mostly because of the science and I, I get the science him and Neil deGrasse Tyson yeah you guys that's fine I understand why you hated it <laughs> um, Monty says you can kind of get the same thing with a filter for the new cameras uh, lonely spec Forward, lonelyspec.com forward slash sharpstar. Don't care. I, I, I don't want. I don't want that. Don't want. Don't want. Uh, was someone sending me an email with with a picture attached that I was supposed to wait for? MacMan, I dug up my original iPhone. Oh, cool. Um, other emails? Do I get anything else? I got some more emails. Just the the they're, they're a little long for. This late in the show, I'm just trying to see which ones I can get to real quick. Um, nope, 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 nope. 
Uh, real quick, Greg Greg Gare says, I don't chase rumors very often. I found this one fascinating. This is back in April. Uh, Apple rumored to be interested in buying Disney. No, that's bullshit. It's always going to be bullshit. Apple's never going to, Disney's never, never going to sell. Apple's never going to buy them. Uh, they'll, they'll work together, but they're, they're not going to um, um, be bought. Uh, Neil, I'm assuming by the spelling and pronunciation of your name, Neil, you're in Ireland. I might understand that after OS 11, iOS 11, takes over my iPhone and iPad, I'll never get those irritating, aggravating, exasperating, annoying reminders to submit a review. Please tell me it is so. Please, please, please. It is so, Neil. Not only that, Apple is limiting the way reviewer, oh, sorry, the way apps show you those reviews and limiting the number of times in a calendar year those reviews, those review requests can pop up. The other good thing about them is those review requests can be done now inside the app. I think, <clears throat> at least personally, I'll be more likely to leave a review in some apps if they're not taking me out of the app to go write the review. I'll be able to do it in the app. I'll probably do that more often. But you can also turn that off completely. Uh, there will be a setting in iOS 11 where you it will be just don't ever ask me for a review. And... We won't be able to do those. Monty says, praise the deity. I hate those nag messages. I think we hate them because, typical, developers overuse them. I get, there are some apps that will ask you seemingly once a week. And even when you say no, I don't want to, it pops back up again. Or I hate this app, it pops back up again. Uh, Mac Man's posting a photo of his original iPhone to Slack. All right, let me see. Do, do, do. Come on, come on, boys. Wayne says, is there a Rotten Tomatoes clone for cameras? Uh, Wayne, the, the, the site I trust most for reviews of cameras is DP Review. D-P-R-E-V-I-E-W.com. Um, that, for me, is the most trustworthy of the uh, sites that... Uh, I would ever use for reviews. They're they're the guys that I like the most when it comes to uh, reviewing um, reviewing stuff on the iPhone. Sorry, on on cameras. Uh, here's a picture of the <laughs> the original. That's not the original. Oh, is it? Yes, it is. It is. It is. Sorry, 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 sorry. So I can't pull this up. This is Mark Man's uh, Mac Man's Mac Man's original iPhone with the hacked skin on it. Man, that's ugly. Boy, that's awfully ugly. And it's not attractive at all. Um, let me see. That's it. That's it. Let's see if there's any other emails coming in. No, there are not. We're done. Again, as in time for next show, send me your reminiscences of your original iPhone, uh, what you were doing uh, 10 years ago tomorrow, uh, were you in line at any original iPhone, at, at the, any of the original iPhone launches? Um, it, and again, tell me if you agree or disagree. I think that it's a product where we, we will never have that level of excitement for a launch ever again. I don't think we're ever going to see uh, I gotta pull the video up of of this thing. Hang on, let me just. Uh, I don't think we're ever gonna see the excitement for a single product like we did for that one particular iPhone launch. Um, it's like I can't see us having a product that is that um, universal. That so many people um, want, need, use the phone, just the phone in general. You know, what other product does 95% of the population carry around with them? Their car keys, their wallet, credit card. You know, none of those things can you think of would have the kind of um, innovation out of the iPhone. It's going to take something that's going to be utterly remarkable for 
us to be that excited over it again. Again, if you watch the video um, that I posted on the loop, the, the end of it, uh, the last two minutes when we're actually walking into the store, I can still remember the sound of that crowd of all the Apple employees yelling and hooting and hollering and clapping and us clapping and high-fiving each other and just the excitement in that room and in that space. I don't think I'll ever be in a situation like that ever again. It was cool. It was really, really cool. I'm glad I went. Um, it was expensive, but I'm glad I was able to experience that that event. It was uh, definitely, a uh, over time, a life-changing event and moment. So send me your uh, reminiscences of the original iPhone, and we'll talk about them on next week's show. Until next week's show, as always, I want to say thanks to our good friend Jim Downpro of The Loop at loopinsight.com, and also to you guys, the listeners, whether you're tuned in live via the archive, live via the archive, whether you're tuned in live in the IRC chat room or the Slack room or just watching the video or whether you are listening in via the archive, thank you guys very much for joining me here each and every week. Until next week, I've been Sean King, and you've been listening to your Mac Life. See ya!